Hi, I'm J. Christopher Proctor. I was EPOG 2016. Is that how what we're calling ourselves now? Um, <laughs> last year's EPOG. Um, and so I will be chairing and then speaking briefly on rethinking economics and some of the, the student, student initiatives around this. Um, and I guess just a quick introduction to kind of the next three plenary sessions of what we're trying to do here. Um, we, we looked around the world and saw that things are quite crazy um, and, and didn't know exactly what kind of words to put on what was going on, um, but we thought it would be a good thing to just bring it out and talk about it for, for the next couple sessions. So getting very real world, economic policies in the age of globalization. Um, so we're starting with the actual economics itself, economic science, the academic side of things, um, and hopefully it will be great. <laughs> Okay, so my name is Caroline Ortlip. Um, I'm basically then EPOC 2015, so I graduated two years ago. Um, and yes, yeah, so we have uh, two great speakers today. First, um, Juan Grania, I'm Professor of Economics at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. Um, and he will talk, but first we'll have a presentation by Marc Lavoie, I'm Professor of Economics at Paris 13. And uh, yeah, so basically I directly give the word to you. That's okay. All right. So I did prepare a PowerPoint. Didn't have a clue how much time I was supposed to talk. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not a French economist. Okay, so this was... <laughs> Uh, this, this is the, the topic that was assigned to me uh, by, uh, well, in particular, Joel. How has the mainstream adapted to or learned from the changing economic landscape in the aftermath of the crisis? It's quite a long, uh, quite a long title. Um, so. Uh, I've been asked in the past about a little bit about this, uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm going to use some of what I have prepared in the past. There may be a few slides that uh, the EPOG 2016 have seen last year, but hopefully not, not too many. And in, in any case, I've been told to talk 20 or 25 minutes, so I'll have to skip some of these uh, things. Okay, I was at the University of Leeds uh, a few weeks ago, and what the students there uh, started with on this topic was this statement by Olivier Blanchard, which is fairly recent. The crisis was a traumatic event during which we all had to question many cherished beliefs. So I'll try to see uh, what are these uh, cherished uh, beliefs and how they have been changed, or if anything has been changed. Um, maybe just a, a short uh, course on what is a paradigm, because after all, we, the mainstream is the dominant paradigm. Uh, this is a word used by Kuhn, or Kuhn. Uh, he thought that uh, paradigms change with rev revolutionary changes, that suddenly one set of beliefs is being replaced by another. So I was never fully comfortable with that. I'm more at ease with uh, another view by another philosopher of science called Larry Loden who wrote a book in 1977, and I found a reference about this in the book uh, written by John Phoebe, who was the creator, he was the first editor of the Review of Political Economics. And uh, Lauden instead speaks of research traditions, and the difference between Kuhn and, and Lauden is that Lauden believes that several different paradigms or research traditions can exist simultaneously, that sometimes they fade, but they may also make a comeback. So I think it, it's a better view of what is happening and has hap happened. So what will be the final impact of the crisis on academia as of 2012, when I first thought about this, I had written down three possibilities. 
So the first one was that the mainstream uh, would become even tighter in its beliefs, that things would be uh, even, even worse, if you want, for anybody believing in something else than uh, the new consensus model or the real business cycle, and that if any changes would be made, they, they would be very peripheral. Um, the second possibility uh, is that, well, macroeconomics is going to be split into two parts. So one which uh, is how things work right now within the crisis, and the other being, well, th the normal times uh, when we are not in the crisis, or if you want, before 2008. And then the, the last possibility uh, I figured was that, well, I mean, having seen so many mistakes being done uh, before 2008, one would believe that, uh, well, maybe our colleagues would be more tolerant to different views, having realized that uh, those making decisions had to rely on these alternative views during the crisis. At least uh, alternative views that can be formalized. And, uh, and then, well, now I believe there's a fourth possibility, uh, which is a dismissal of the current macroeconomic theory. Um, right after the crisis, there were a few people who argued that uh, the current macroeconomics was a big waste of time, but now there's more of that coming out. And in particular, uh, one person I know personally, Bill White, uh, who was uh, the chief economist at the Bank for International Settlements, now working at the OECD, in 2009 wrote, the crisis provides evidence that the simplifying assumptions on which much of modern macroeconomics is based were not useful in explaining real world developments. So obviously it should be replaced by something else. Oops, wrong. Where is enter? Okay. <laughs> okay, so the outline is I'm going to talk a little bit about micro, I'm going to talk about macro, and I'm going to talk a bit about how economic policies have uh, changed. Uh, on micro, uh, I should say that in 2009, my belief then was that if there was to be a big winner uh, because of the crisis, it would be new behavioral economics. Um, and this was also what uh, Shiladao argued uh, in a paper in 2013. And I, I remember uh, around 2009, at least in Canada, the, the different government agencies were desperately looking for people in behavioral economics. On top of that, they ha behavioral economics have had uh, recent, um, well, so-called Nobel Prizes. And, uh, and then in 2013, as we know, Robert Schiller got a Nobel Prize. Just as an anecdote, I should say that I heard Robert Schiller make a presentation in New York City around 2002, 2003, and my impression then was that he, he was just a closet post-Keynesian. I mean, he was making exactly the kind of arguments that we were uh, making. Um, well, uh, w w what do post-Keynesian economists or heterodox economists uh, say, or how do they react to new behavioral economics? Uh, there are five reactions. Uh, I think most of us are just ignoring it, except for a few uh, economists uh, like John Harvey and Giuseppe Fontana. Then, uh, as, as they became, I mean, with the Nobel Prizes that they got and, and so on, there was a uh, big excitement. This seemed to be the next uh, best thing that ever happened to us. Um, and as I said, well, people like De Grove, uh, Schillers look like closet post Keynesians. And then there was some kind of disappointment. I, I remember reading the book by Akerlof and Schiller called Animal Spirits that Lots of people said it, it was great, and I was rather disappointed, and John King also had the same uh, reaction. By the way, I should say that 
it's not everybody who gets excited by Akerlof because Akerlof came to give a, a, a lecture at the Canadian Economics Association a few years ago. And um, I mean, it's only older people who seem to appreciate what he was saying. All the young guys, young Turks of neoclassical theory uh, thought, well, you know, this is completely uh, use, useless. Okay, and then, so there's this kind of distrust vis-a-vis -vis, uh, new behavioral economics. I'm gonna split this and move on to uh, macroeconomics. Okay, possibility number one is all is good now. I mean, we are in 2017, uh, nine or 10 years after the crisis, and there's this guy, Ricardo Ress, uh, that I read recently who argued that mainstream macroeconomic theory is not in a crisis because the American Economic Review is publishing as many papers on macro topics as, as it used to. So obviously there's no crisis in macroeconomics. And then he kept on going saying, well, mainstream macroeconomics does not ignore financial factors because by 2013, close to 200 papers had been written on macroeconomics with financial frictions. I don't know what you guys think about this, but it seems that, you know, if, if we describe uh, bankruptcies, uh, defaults, people losing their house, and so on, as, uh, as a financial friction, to me, the, it doesn't uh, seem very uh, useful. Possibility number two is, as I mentioned at the very beginning, a dual macroeconomics, and this kind of argument can be found in the book by Richard Koo, uh, uh, which was written, in fact, before the crisis, but he was, it's, it's before the U.S. crisis, but of course, Japan has been in a crisis since 1990. Uh, and so his argument is that mainstream theory, profit maximization is valid in normal times, but in depression times, uh, firms are rather pursuing debt minimization. And uh, Paul Krugman is, is more or less saying the same thing in his book, Depression Economics, and DeLong and Summers, uh, also in a paper published in 2012. So that's another way to see uh, things. In particular, there is this uh, claim that everything changes once we reach the zero lower bound on interest rates. Okay, this is, so Ku has this dichotomy. So again, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, skip it. Uh, yeah, well, about DeLong and Summers, this is what, it, what they're saying. In depression times, there's an absence of supply constraints. Monetary policy is constrained by a zero lower bound, as I was saying. The fiscal multiplier is positive in recession time, possibly even as large as 1.5 or bigger. Uh, there are hysteresis, super hysteresis effects. I'll talk about that. And fiscal expansion might be self-financing, meaning that if you increase government expenditures, in the short run it will raise the debt to GDP ratio, but in the long run it will reduce it. But they, they still believe that in normal times the fiscal multiplier is equal to zero. Possibility number three, so I think I mentioned that last year, more tolerance. So here you have a statement by Olivier Blanchard, which I found very interesting. He's saying a hundred intellectual flowers are blooming. He's talking about Hyman Minsky. He's talking about these Caldorian models of growth and distribution that you've heard about. He's talking about monetary financing of the fiscal uh, deficit, and you know some very well-known people do uh, put that forward. And again, hysteresis is making a comeback. Um, so, if we take this view, uh, any school of thought that would benefit from this uh, more tolerant approach? We've already mentioned behavioral economics. What about neo-Austrian theory, uh, post-Keynesian macroeconomics, agent-based modeling, uh, or sometimes people call it complexity economics, 
or more simply new Keynesian economics. It seemed for a time that, uh, okay, people would disregard new classical macroeconomics, but they would still believe that new Keynesian economics was uh, a reasonable mainstream uh, view. Well, we know now that uh, these, uh, at least post-Keynesian economics, new Austrian e economics, well, did benefit from some uh, uh, increased interest, but uh, we're still having problems in academia. Uh, Hutchson, who uh, is an institutionalist, uh, believed that uh, he, he didn't think this third possibility would really arise, and he, he said so in 2009 in the Cambridge Journal of Economics. Finally, there's the fourth possibility, which I had not really uh, considered, where you have a, a large number of famous economists who uh, really believe that both the new classical model and the new Keynesian model uh, are just not, just not up to task. So you've got Stiglitz saying that part of the reason we got into the crisis was because of these models. Uh, Bill White, which I mentioned uh, before, uh, says, well, these models, with these models, it's impossible to have a crisis, so they can certainly not be uh, useful. Um, there were people as early as 2009 who were quite critical, uh, like Richard Posner from the University of Chicago Law School, who uh, was a, a true believer in neoclassical economics and who completely turned around in 2009. I've already mentioned Akerlof and Schiller, Buter, uh, Beuter, I've, I've mentioned a number of times. Um, he was very much annoyed at all these DSGE uh, models. But, uh, and, and of course, Robert Solo, uh, who says that uh, all these models are dumb and dumber, dumber macroeconomics. Um, uh, recently, I saw an article that was saying that all these uh, real business cycle models or new classical models were beautiful but mad, <laughs> and saying that new Keynesian economics was not that much better, um, that the purpose of these models uh, was in fact to, to publish within the profession rather than a concern to understand how the macroeconomy works. Most recently, may, perhaps a lot of you have heard about this, Paul Romer, the new chief economist at the World Bank, uh, also said that uh, he had observed more than three decades of intellectual regress, so it means that Things uh, are worse now than they were 30 years ago. And he called these, at least the new classical models, he, he called them pseudoscience. And uh, in that paper, he used satire, satire, humor, sarcasm. He, when he describes these models, he talks of imaginary shocks, phlogiston, troll, gremlin, ether. Uh, uh, as uh, real business cycle theory keeps referring to technology sh shocks and changes in preferences that affect the labor supply. And there's a paper which is very funny also, I encourage you to read it, it's nothing, uh, it, it, it's, it's not really a scientific paper, but it's, it's fun to read, it's the paper by Steve Keen in the review of Keynesian economics, it's very funny to read. Apparently there was a there was a controversy between the editors of the journal whether or not they should publish the paper. <laughs> um, right, uh, and then a, a number of people have been saying that DSG models are only good uh, when nothing special. So when the economy is nearly uh, flat, not you know being in the great moderation, then they're good, but as soon as you get out of that, then they're completely uh, use, useless. And then the, uh, something that struck me was a presentation by Justin uh, Wolfers, who 
was a student of Blanchard and who was a co-author of Blanchard and is fairly well known and at uh, a conference in honor of uh, Blanchard, to honor Blanchard, he uh, made a presentation where he had exactly this slide, uh, things that probably are not true, and he says rational expectations, DSG models, consumption Euler equations, Calvo pricing, new Keynesian Phillips curves, and the classical dichotomy between money and, and the real world. So if, if you take this away, I mean, if these things are not true, then in my opinion, and I guess in his, there is not much left of mainstream macroeconomics. Okay, I'll skip Colander because when he talks to uh, to mainstream people, he says DSG models are great, and when he talks to us, he says they are terrible. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, something to, <laughs> I've got something against. So, do I have five or five more minutes, or? Yeah, okay. Uh, the relation between economic theory and economic policy, there are two views on this. So Keynes used to say that Politicians are following the views of dead economists, so we are influencing politicians. But Paul Samuelson had the opposite view. He thought politicians and business people were influencing uh, economists. So he was saying, if you want to understand what economists, most economists are saying, then he says, you have to follow the money. Okay, um, so any change in, with respect to policy? Well, we can certainly say that in 2009, there was a Keynes moment, or uh, maybe also a Minsky moment, where suddenly all governments started pursuing Keynesian policies, expansionary uh, fiscal policies, and so on. Um, one could also say that the IMF has changed uh, to some extent. Uh, I, I recently wrote a, an article with uh, uh, a postdoc uh, on this issue. And uh, my colleague Mario Sakareccia has uh, come up with a, a word to explain this switch at the IMF and this switch in the way fiscal policies is being seen or perceived by all governments except those in Europe, which is called new fiscalism which means that, okay, when things are really going wrong, we should, be have, we should have Keynesian policies, um, but as soon as they seem to be going slightly uh, better, when there are green shoots, as it was uh, said, uh, then immediately we should go back to sound finance. We should try to balance the budget again. Uh, one thing that my friend here, Danny Long, uh, w certainly likes is, is the fact that there's hysteresis and super hysteresis is coming back. So the idea that if there is a negative shock on the economy, either for some external reason or because of the monetary policy of the central bank that tries to slow down inflation, this will have uh, long-term consequences either on the level of potential output or on uh, the rate of growth of potential output. And this is an idea that was long defended 15 years ago by those two uh, post-Keynesians, Leon Ledesma and Thurlwall, and many others. So I'll skip this. Uh, the staff, uh, well, th there's at least one person at the IMF who has completely changed uh, his views on uh, and what happens, and this is Jonathan Ostry. Uh, proudly, I can say that he was a student at the University of Ottawa in the early, well, in the mid-1970s, so I was not yet a professor there. <laughs> but he, fi he finally came to his senses uh, <laughs> after a few years of the crisis. So here you have all the things that he's now saying, like capital controls are bringing more inequality, uh, if you have more inequality, you'll have slower growth. And I, I, I ask, well, if, if capital controls are bad for income inequality, what about free trade? Isn't that even worse? And he, tell, he told me, yes, uh, I'm, you know, I'm a little bit 
uh, puzzle about this. <coughs> and then he wrote this paper with a couple of colleagues on the belief that neoliberal policies may not have had such good effects on the economy. When we do the EPOG interviews, we often ask the question, what do you think about uh, free trade and uh, free capital movements? And then a lot of these EPOG students tell us, yeah, this is the greatest thing that has ever happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> they don't become me EPOG students, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, uh, mainstream people have discovered a few paradoxes. So I've put uh, one here in bold. Uh, Krugman has discovered or rediscovered the flexibility uh, paradox, which means that the more flexible wages and prices are, the more dramatic the perverse Fisher death effects will be. If prices go down and wages go down, then the real value of your debt is going to go up and you're going to be in big trouble. And there's another one which I found also very funny, is the one put forward by Macaulay, Paul Macaulay, who is the inventor of this expression, shadow banking. And he, he has the paradox of degrading standards. Uh, default rates are low because of the degradation of underwriting standards. You know, at the beginning, as everybody is able to get loans, then everybody is able to spend, and therefore anybody that has an asset or a house will see the price of this asset or this price of house go up, and therefore these degrading standards will give the impression that everything is for the best. Okay, I'm being given lots of signs here, so I will stop here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, so we're gonna go directly to our next uh, presentation um, by Juan Granier, which will give us a bit more insights, especially about Latin America and the cases there. Um, so basically from theory, a bit more to practice. <laughs> Well, first, thank you very much for the invitation. It's an honor to be here, flying from Argentina. So, uh, I, I was told about Joel, what uh, Mark was going to present, so I, I advanced a little on what is happening in Latin America. And as the title of the presentation states, not much. The right, the neoliberal policies are the same, and they keep coming back, and they keep came back, especially in Brazil and Argentina in the last couple of years. So first, I want to show you a little bit of what the neoliberal policies do to countries, especially underdeveloped countries. And then I'm going to change the focus from neoliberal or orthodox economies to ourselves. What are we saying to governments? What is the policies that came through our science in order to prevent from neoliberal to keep coming back to a government? So, Let's start. As you can see, this is the evolution of GDP in Argentina. You can see the, the really big recession in 2002. It's really big. And the growth that happened in the 2000s and the stagnation that uh, started in 2013. And it's still there with a couple of years of recession and growth and recession and growth. But if you see Brazil, the recession wasn't so big in 1999. But the Dilma Rousseff last year and the coup d'etat with Temer was really harsh on the Brazilian economy and it's in a big recession since a couple of years ago. If we see the way share, this is Argentina again, the, the effects of neoliberal policies in the 90s, it's quite evident. The crisis in 2002, the devaluation of the peso, the downfall of the, wage, of the real wage in 2002 and the recovery thereafter, and the stagnation in the last years. If we see Brazil, the 90s is again a bad, bad time, and the 2000s, it's a little bit better, but not marvelous. If you see unemployment, Argentina first, which we reached a hike of 25% of the economically active population in 2002, 
then the recovery was uh, quite intensive in employment and the unemployment fell down to one digit and remained there since then. If you see the last two years, the unemployment is again on its way up. Brazil, for instance, again, the 90s, a really bad time, the 2000s, a little bit better, and the couple of last years have been really rough on Brazil. Just to see balance of payments quite quickly, let me picture everything. As you can see, Argentina has a structural deficit on income. This is evident. A lot of uh, foreign companies remitting utilities, benefits, and, and what else. But during the good times, we managed to pay that balance on income with, uh, with a balanced trade uh, superavits. But in the last years, with the downfall of international prices, the current account deficit grew quite unsustainable, and we, as every country does, uh, went to foreign debt in order to pay it up. But as you can see, it's not the best way to manage an economy. If you see Brazil, the same picture comes, obviously in bigger numbers, since Brazil is a bigger economy. Let me, as you can see, since the 2010, Brazil is running a, an a current, a current account deficit, big current account deficit, financed with debt, especially debt. So, in order to summarize quickly these this trends, you see, of course, the neoliberalism didn't fulfill its promises of growth, income, uh, employment, and stuff. And the first decade of this century was quite good. But, and this is really important, the last years, where stagnation came in, when uh, foreign or, or balance of payment deficit kick in and, and certain problems started to be really bad for the economies. Argentina and Brazil. Brazil started first, but both economies were hard on employment, on wages. But moreover, when right-wing parties took office, those trends, those bad trends, worsened. In Argentina, where last year was a big recession, Brazil is in a big recession that it's trying to recover. This, this year, unemployment went up, real wages were down. So, I think these trends, this stagnation in the last years of the progressive po political processes, opened the way, opened the, the door for the right-wing parties to come back to power. So, I think that's where we need to focus on what we do we, as a progressive people, economics and stuff, do when we get to office. But just to say that the right is the same right, that it's always been the same right in Latin America, we see the Macri and Tremer agenda. In the first few months, a drive for government surpluses with foreign debt, labor and social security reform, both in Argentina and Brazil. Brazil uh, is trying to get a law to banish uh, fiscal deficits for a long run. Argentina, it's reforming labor markets, it's reforming social security. We have a liberalization of, of financial markets and we have in both countries the, the drive to accelerate negotiations of foreign trade. First, Argentina and Brazil tried to, to get into the TTP. Lucky for us, uh, Trump turned it down because if not we were going to end up there. We try to go in an, to an alliance with the Pacific Alliance, that it's Chile, Peru, Colombia, and Mexico, that it's a right-wing alliance. And if nothing of that works, Argentina is trying to accelerate the negotiations with, with, between Mercosur and the European Union in order to get a, a free trade account, a free trade accord. So let's focus on the economic causes of the return of the right to power. As I said, last decade, pretty good. Ground rent with international prices uh, in historical high levels was redistributed through a number of, of mechanisms, macro, meso, and microeconomic uh, channels. Not only the most uh, known Bolsa Familia and uh, the universal income in Argentina, but many others. We had uh, subsidies for investment, uh, interest rate subsidies, et cetera, et cetera. That growth went into the industrial sectors, that industrial sectors created employment, that 
uh, increased real wages and the economy became, uh, became uh, working again. But when international prices declined, Argentina and Brazil went back into the same problems in the 90s, in the 80s, in the 70s, in the 60s. So what can we say? Well, the progressive policies that were implemented in the region during the 2000s weren't able to conduct a structural change of the economy. We are right now, as we were 15 years ago, the same underdeveloped country that we were everywhere. We haven't changed how our economy works. So when international prices collapse, the, the economy collapses. And with that, the progressive policies that implement during the high, high prices era and the right wing came, comes back to power. Let's see why I say the structural economy hasn't changed. If you see the incidence of primary and agricultural industry exports from Argentina, flatline in around 70%. About 70% of Argentina's exports are derived from agricultural soybean or, uh, I don't know, oil from soybean, etc. Look at Brazil. Brazil started better, around 50%, but had a reprimarization of the economy in the 2000s. The international prices were so high that the economy went to those sectors, the real exchange rate came down, the industry suffered. Look at the manufacturing GDP. Argentina recovered from the crisis, but then in the last five or six years, again, the industry is suffering big. Look at Brazil hasn't had more production in the industrial sector since the 90s. So this is quite difficult. And another one, if you see, this is Argentina labor productivity since 1970. This is Brazil. And this is the United States. It's clear we're not catching up. And it's clear that most of the trend it's explained in the last decade. So we had a better economy, we had a better labor market, we had better income, but the economy wasn't, wasn't catching up to anyone. So when international prices came down, the economy came down to those uh, structural uh, features. So let's look a moment on us. The first statement, I think it's quite clear. I take it as mine, but I leave it to you. It seems the right never changes in Latin America. The agenda is the same, the political process are the same, the reforms they try to implement is the same. So it's at least partly our fault they keep coming back. The partly was suggested by something, someone in the audience. I, I wrote directly, it's our fault. But let's put that, it's a happier sentence. So if we consider development not as a pushing on the aggregate demand to get out of crisis, but from an underdeveloped country trying to catch up with the, uh, with the standards of living of the developed world, the United States, Europe, or whatever model you try to follow, structural change is needed. The economies must change what they produce, how they produce it, and who do, we, do they employ, how they pay wages, how uh, social security works, and stuff. So, for that, state intervention is essential. There's no room for neoliberalism in Latin America. They keep coming back, but there's no solution for us in retrieving the state from the economy. So, and this is a question for you to, in the audience, several questions need to be answered, both simultaneously and coherently. We can't say we're gonna do take these policies and these policies that don't match. We have to answer everything in order to have a plan, in order when we get to the government, try to implement it. Just a few issues, don't worry. It's big issues. Just a few, but big. Which sectors or firms should be encouraged in order to get the economy to change? Is it sector-based? We have to focus on manufacturing. Is it big firms or is it SMEs? Who do we encourage? To answer that, we need to look at 
their employment generation, what kind of wages, what kind of uh, labor force they employ. Do we have the, that labor force? Do they invest? Do they export? We have a balance of payment constraint. Do they do R&D? Do we have an answer to this? Or every economic, or, or every heterodox economist is saying something different? No, we don't have a consensus. The neoliberalism does have a consensus. No state. What is our answer to that? We don't have one. How is the best way to finance that effort? Foreign debt? Argentina doesn't have a good run with foreign debt. You probably picture that. Foreign investment? Attracting foreign companies in order to invest in the country? That's not the best idea. Do we capture natural resource rent? From the heterodox, we know that it could be a curse from natural resources or it could be a fine fountain of resources. Which is it? Is it bad to have natural resources or is it good? We don't know. How are we going to promote working class welfare? welfare? Particularly those affected by structural change because someone is going to lose its job. When the sectors change, when the firms change, when the geographically uh, economy changes. Do we know? We're discussing about labor market based. Do we have to go through minimum wage policies? Do we have to go to labor unions? Do we have to apply universal income as Finland or as every other country it's promoting? Do any of these questions are coherent with the other ones? I think this is the problem. And above all, this came up in several of the panels uh, during this day. How do these structural change policies match with the stage of capitalism as it is? How do Argentina or Brazil catch up with the United States or Europe in the era of automation? Or in the era of delocalization? Do we have something to offer the International Division of Labor, that it's not natural resources? Is it cheap labor? Let's hope not, because it's got to get really cheap in order to get that position in the International Division of Labor. Do you have R&D? No, we don't. So, what is our place in Latin America for a development scheme? I think, and that's my small contribution, that is a, a small task as a heterodox economist to question how we're going to develop a scheme for underdeveloped countries in the, two, in the 21st century. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so basically coming from uh, those two professors and their presentations of having an overview where mainstream is coming from and what has happened since the crisis for them and having some practical insights of what progressive policy um, had happened in South America, um, we kind of want to take our view um, from the student's perspective as well because, um, I mean, we as students of econo economics or people also from other disciplines who are partially economists, um, there has been a lot of changes and a lot of activism happening. And uh, Jay Christopher has been um, working with a lot with rethinking economics, so he's going to give us some insights on what those guys have been doing and what's been happening on the student side. Um, and so we'll make a leap a bit towards Epoch then and then open up for discussion. Does anybody know how to do full screen here? What? Thank you, crowd. Um, hi. So I am still Jay Christopher Proctor. And just uh, so a couple quick words about what some of the students are doing. Um, I think a lot of people in this room will already know quite a bit about rethinking economics, but I know for a lot of others, you don't know all the cool stuff we're doing. So I'll just do a quick update. Um, so first of all, what is it that these students want? What started this whole thing? The first thing is real world economics. 
Uh, rethinking came out of the crash, came out of 2008, with students who were being taught all kinds of things in the textbooks that just didn't match up with what we were seeing in the real world. There was no crisis, there was no climate change, all of these fairly basic things that we think we should be studying in an economics class weren't there. Um, the second question is diversifying economics. So when you do an undergraduate degree in economics, you feel like you're getting all kinds of ideas thrown at you, but if you look closer, you can realize that it's actually just the exact same book, the exact same ideas being repeated over and over again. So diversity in ideas, but also diversity in people and who is being presented, what kind of ideas and approaches are, are going on. Um, and, and then the third thing that we've really taken on as part of our mission is the idea of demystifying and democratizing economics. Economics can be a language unto itself that very often serves as a barrier for normal non-economists to understand what it is we're talking about. And this is an interesting problem because it's just as big of a problem for the heterodox community as the mainstream community. So this has been something we've worked quite hard to try to bring economics outside of academia and create a place within the public where we can talk about these things. Um, so if you're interested in any of that, welcome to Rethinking Economics. This is, this is us. Um, so where are we? Um, pretty much everywhere, but quite Europe and quite UK focused. Um, one note, there are a lot of other groups doing very similar things to Rethinking Economics. Um, the ICPE, the International Student Initiative for Pluralism and Economics, is sort of a larger umbrella group. Um, there are a lot of people here who can talk about that more, but Rethinking has sort of been my last three years, so that's what I can present best. Um, but this is, this is our spread, and what do we do? So the real core heart of Rethinking is local groups. Uh, most groups are university-based, so we have one in Kingston, there's one in Torino now, and we host lectures and debates and reading groups and discussions, and we invite people in to try to create the debate that we didn't see in our curriculum. Um, so that's, that's really what it looks like in terms of day-to-day -day being in a rethinking economics group. Um, the other side of that is lobbying universities. Uh, where this has taken on a very different flavor in different universities. So at Kingston, for instance, we weren't necessarily trying to fight with our university to get more pluralism, um, but trying to help the university to see, like, what can we do together to get somewhere. Whereas somewhere like Manchester, they've been at all-out war with the university to get any inch of pluralism introduced. Um, and then conferences have been another big thing. Things like this where we can get to know people face to face and really start to build ideas and projects and have bigger things come out of that. Um, and just one note on conferences. If you happen to be in Scotland in October, there's going to be a big INET and Rethinking and a lot of other people hosting a joint conference together in Edinburgh. So that's something to keep, keep on the radar. Um, but the, the main thing I want to talk about is some of the bigger network projects that we work on. These are the, the big ticket items that we get quite excited about. Uh, so the first that I'll, I'll mention briefly is The Econocracy. It was a book that was written by three of the Manchester graduates that was launched this fall. And half of the book is sort of explaining economic pluralism, the problems with mainstream economics, sort of a lot of the things that are our day-to-day -day world in, this, in the movement. Um, and the second half, which was quite interesting, was a curriculum review of the curriculum at, I believe, seven UK universities, where they actually got the tests from every class that you would have to take at that university for an economics degree. And they tried to rate each question on the test to say whether ask students to operate a mo model, evaluate ideas, describe a theory, or was a simple multiple choice question. And you can see in here that about 24% actually ask students to evaluate, which is what we would consider critical thinking. Um, but it, it's much more striking when you look at the breakdown of disciplines. So something like history of economic thought is almost entirely evaluation. And a lot of the subject matter uh, materials of like, policy analysis, public economics, development economics, have much more evaluation. And when you get down to micro and macro, very little, very little evaluation. Um, so another, another big project that we're, will be coming out quite soon is our Rethinking Economics textbook. So for about the last two and a half years, it has taken quite a while, we have been trying to put together a reader in pluralist economics. Um, and so it'll finally be launched this October. And the idea is that 
It's something that can be given to undergraduate students in the first year or two of an economics degree to be read alongside with whatever mainstream textbook is being taught. So we're definitely seeing this just as a first step of getting pluralism introduced into classrooms where it would otherwise be quite difficult. Um, and the hope is that it will make it much easier for sympathetic professors and lecturers to do something without having to go out and design an entire course or an entire program. Um, and so just the, the, the kind of heart of what this project is, is we wanted to create the kind of book that we wish that we had had when we were starting to study economics. And so you can see the, it, it's arranged by schools of economic thought, and we have a couple of the authors in this room, and we are very thankful for to you. Um, and this will be available in October, and we'd be very thankful if you guys would uh, support that. And just the, the last major project that we, we have is economy. This is our major project in democratizing economics, and it's a news and entertainment platform where the idea was we're going to talk to people who don't like economics, who don't identify with economics, who don't want to have anything to do with it. And we're going to talk to them about things that don't sound like economics normally. Um, so a lot of entertainment, basic news items, football, uh, politics, and then try to slip in the economics or explain economics where we can. Or the, the flip side is when there are really big economic stories that we can't avoid, that we're going to try to take those head on and explain them in as simple of terms as possible of just what is going on. And, and so this has been uh, quite a fun project. And, and this is another place I've spent quite a lot of time. And that's uh, ecnmy.org, so economy without the vowels. Um, and the other half of this is there's a massive textbook that lives on this website that we have written um, that is hundreds of pages sort of buried into the internet. And it's our guide to understandable economics. So the idea is that we've taken bite-sized questions, things like what are interest rates, and then try to do a 300 to 400 word explanation using as little jargon as possible of what that is and then linking to all the other places that that would be important. So on here, there might be a link to what is monetary policy or something like that to where you can really kind of jump around and learn quite a bit about economics in bite-sized chunks. Um, so just to kind of segue from what the students in Rethinking are doing to what we're doing here this week, um, I just had a couple questions that have been going through my head. Um, and I know we have specific time to talk about some of this stuff on Wednesday morning, um, but I think really just throughout the week. This is kind of good things to keep in mind. Um, the first is what can we build together as EPOG alumni and staff? We have a lot of people here who have a lot of expertise. Um, and it wouldn't be too difficult if everyone was able to commit a little bit of time to organize something together that was quite, quite useful and quite big and impressive. And so that's the kind of thing that we're thinking about at Rethinking. Um, just one quick pitch for an idea that we're in the developmental phase of, but we're at Rethinking Torino, we're thinking about trying to create some kind of master's thesis archive to where people could publish online their theses um, and just have somewhere that it lives online so people can search it, people can cite it, and it can be out there in the world. Um, and, and if you're interested in that, please talk to us because we're sort of hoping to start taking that project more seriously in the next month or so. Um, the next question is, how do we get out of our bubbles? And I, I think of this really in two ways. The first of how do we get out of the heterodox economics bubble and communicate with the rest of academia, but also how do we get out of the academia bubble and really communicate with, with everyone, with anyone who has a stake in economics? Um, and, and I think one thing that I have learned most in the last few years is simple language. Be able to very simply say what it is you're doing um, and to have, say, Tweet your thesis, that, that's a, uh, a project that a lot of people have been trying to push, where just explain what your thesis was in 140 characters. And then there's obviously room for the long form, for the, the technical presentations, but make sure that you can still write a one-page summary of what it was that you're doing that basically anyone can understand. And then just the last question that I wanted to throw out here is, are we ready for a favorable political moment to come? So. I think we have all seen politics can change very rapidly. Um, and when it does, there's a possibility that we are going to be the ones that are being called upon. When a progressive party comes into power and they say, okay, we need economics, we need economic ideas, who are our people? We wanna be those people. And so keeping these questions in mind as we develop our research programs and as we think about what kind of activities and institutions we want to build going forward to try to position ourselves 
as EPOG, but also as a broader movement to be able to step up to the plate when our time comes. Um, and I'll just leave us with our map of the economy that we made for, for our website that we like to use to get people to think about the economy and where your place in it is. Thank you. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, uh, to have actually the student part and what you guys are doing, and that's pretty impressive, and there's a lot of projects going on, and it seems like uh, Rethinking has been doing in the last years a lot of things, and um, also taking this into connection maybe to ECPA, where um, I know quite some students of us have been active on different countries and different national groups. Um, and that's actually the, let's say, connection to EPOC because many of us are doing things, they're doing things in their private time and they take their time in order to um, fight for their beliefs. Um, and so the thing is that within EPOC, we, from, since the beginning, there was the idea that an association within the students and the alumni between EPOC could be a platform where we can actually channel all those efforts and where we can possibly build some of those projects and ideas and realize them. Um, and it's been quite difficult to establish something like that, partially, well, definitely due to the fact that we're all very busy during the two EPOC years. Um, and also afterwards, people are getting out, this other stuff happening. But um, the developments we've done, we've done two meetings in 2014 and 2015 um, with representatives of kind of, um, in 2015, of all the cohorts that are also present um, today and uh, those days here. Um, and the statutes for the association have come out and we've advanced quite on that and around Joel and that uh, group, they've advanced on this and the statutes for the association are registered. So basically we have a platform ready to go, which is just like um, my intention really to call upon you to come Wednesday in the morning um, and create something with us and to start building something, to get inspired by other projects people are doing, working together with um, maybe other gr student groups and having ideas and throwing up ideas we are having. How do we want to put our ideas out there? How do we want to communicate? How do we want to um, just go forward about like all the stuff we're discussing here? Um, so I think that's the main thing about the EPOC Alumni and Student Association that is quite important and um, otherwise I would love to open the room for discussions now um, especially where we're coming from maybe do you have your three questions though you had like those three questions I think that would be great opportunity to start from that the map spread area, the map spread area. <laughs> um, so should we start just opening up questions from the audience we have especially um, for Mark and Juan Hi, um, I'm Adam, I'm from the second EPOC cohort, um, and I just wanted to ask a question uh, that seeks to particularly tie the first two presentations together. Um, so I want to ask, which contemporary heterodox intellectual traditions represent the best framework for tackling issues of structural change in the view of the presenters? Um, and I wanted to ask, in recent times, is there a partial neglect within some major heterodox streams to, t uh, to grapple with development issues? The second part was, um, in recent times, is there a partial neglect um, within some major heterodox streams to grapple with development issues? Um, hi, I'm Esra. I'm also a second generation EPOC student. Um, so I think my question uh, relates more to the presentation by Marc Lavoie. Um, so recently I read a blog post. Uh, the title was that heterodox economics is not so uh, heterodox anymore. And the author was arguing that actually in the financial sector, especially in the Wall Street, some post-Keynesian models such as stock flow of consistent models and so on are becoming more popular because they include financial sector and they can represent how the real economy works better than, let's say, the SGE models. Uh, and he was citing some chief economists in some important institutions like Standard and & Poor's and Goldman Sachs and so on. 
So it seems like post-Keynesian economics is actually becoming a bit more popular in this kind of spaces. So I just wanted to ask um, if you agree with this observation, um, would you consider this maybe as an achievement for the post-Keynesian tradition? So as heterodox economists, should we try to dominate this kind of spaces more? Or should we take a rather a different ideological approach and opposition to uh, being more associated with this kind of institutions as they are at the moment? We can go and take two, question, two more questions. Uh, Engelbert Stöckhammer from Kingston University. Uh, three very interesting talks. You may have to stop me if my comments get too long. Uh, Mark, I share your overall implicit assessment. I mean, you didn't take a very strong position yourself. You, you reported, but uh, between the lines, I heard that, well, there's sort of a half-hearted attempt of the mainstream to open up and see how we could enrich a bit what we've done. So let's also, on the side, take a quick look what the PKs are doing, but otherwise not bother about them. And if that's roughly your impression, that, that's what I would have thought about what I share. However, I guess what I was a bit missing in your presentation was uh, the, at the end, you, you didn't say, comment on how much we should engage with sort of the, the openings or the contradictions in the mainstream. And I sort of, to, to get the discussion going, I want to take a, a, a quite strong point on that. A few years back, I don't remember, maybe 2007, I wrote the paper where I essentially said, don't bother with the mainstream because they're not going to interact with us anyways. So why talk to someone who's not interested? I would not maintain that at the present situation. I mean, it is my impression that there's uh, so much breaking up in the mainstream that we have to intervene, even if they don't want to listen to us. What is breaking up is essentially a, a, a new version of the saltwater, sweetwater divide. Uh, and this is clearer in the US than in Europe, because in Europe you sometimes worry whether anything is opening up. Uh, in the mainstream, but uh, sort of, I think underneath uh, there is something, and you, you didn't mention the, the Mian and Sufis and, and the papers by Schulerich and, and Borio. I mean, so I think that there's a lot of interesting stuff being produced. It's not mainstream, but there's something out. So I, I would argue, in, in a way, we, we can't avoid engaging with that. And what is, in a way, the, the, the absurdity of the debate is that the mainstream in macroeconomics, which is most relevant for us as PKs, is DSG, and DSG is just blatantly absurd, and you could get rid of it without violating a lot of the mainstream assumptions. So it, 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 it's sort of an absurd bat battle, but that battle will be fought out, and I think we have to be on board. Just two quick comments on that. I mean, in Britain, uh, the, the ESRC, the major research funding institution, did write out a big project uh, with whatever four and a half million or so funding to rebuilding macro in which uh, Gary and I and Özlem and others were involved. Uh, we, we did not get uh, the, 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 the project. However, the consortium that won the project now feels obliged to have us at the table. And so every other month we're finding ourselves on a large table with mainstream economy, open-minded mainstream economists, and sort of trying to overcome our feeling of discomfort that this is an elitist in-group, but on the other hand, I mean, now at least some of us are at some tables. So I, I would uh, uh, emphasize the urgency of engagement. Uh, very quick, Yuan, I thought that was very interesting, your report from Latin America. I think it's very healthy for us in the north to be reminded sort of this perpetual mobile, that the, 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 the enemy is just coming back with the same old shit one is tempted to say, running the danger that one is not using academic language. Now, it, sort of, it, however, I would think that in, in Europe, but maybe that's hope, wishful thinking that I'm engaging it, uh, th th there is a change, and in particular there is something both breaking up in the left and the right. I mean, in, in a way that 
the, the political foundations of the debt-led growth model that in, in, in sort of in the Anglo-Saxon countries came with rising property prices and thus sucked in a lot of the upper middle classes. And in Southern Europe, I would argue to some extent uh, finance uh, uh, gave rise to a boom that indirectly financed the consolidation of the welfare state, which for the Sun European countries, the, in particular the post-fascist one was relatively new. Uh, there's something breaking up and we see that in, in, in sort of the, the, the fights or non-fights in social democracy in Europe, where sort of we have various attempts of modernizing it. So it, it, I, I didn't quite, in, in your presentation, you, you, you were talking about how it ends up, which is the same policies, but sort of something in, in the political landscape seems to be changing. And I wonder whether that's European or whether it's also changing periodically in Latin America. Finally, Chris, also very interesting presentation. Uh, I, I guess two thoughts about rethinking. I think you've d described very nicely how there, there in a way was a shift in rethinking from a very university oriented policy which is essentially let's change the curriculum at my university to a, a shift to a much bigger audience which on the other hand also makes it a lot harder to say when you're successful because I mean Manchester post creation was very clear when they were not successful uh, sort of when you're talking to the world in general, it's a lot harder to say what, what it is that, that uh, you have achieved. And it sounds a bit like you're moving in the direction of a think tank uh, in, in terms of the web page uh, that, that you're setting up. It, and so I'm wondering what that means for organizational structure, sort of how you want to institutionalize. And if there's a think tank, I would think, or a think tank-like structures, you can't run that as sort of former students. You, you need either a, a secure funding stream or you need clear connections to other social movements in, in order to, 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 to have the foundations. I just wanted to hear your thoughts a little bit about it, where you think this is going. And specifically, on, on your last point, to what extent you do think there are connections to political movements. Uh, for Britain, I have to say, I haven't noticed it. Not that the Corbyn group is very open, but I also haven't seen the rethinkers actively trying to engage with it. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question here, and then we'll do a round of answers, and then hopefully at least one more round of questions and comments. Thank you. I'm Lena from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So I'd like to thank you, all of you, for your uh, inspiring presentations. And also uh, tell uh, Jay Christopher that I, I think that it's fantastic the job you're doing with us democratizing economics. It's very, very nice, and I hope you're going to be very successful. Uh, my questions are to Juan, uh, because I, I think that I have a different understanding, at least about Brazil. Uh, I think that the return of the living dead, uh, the right wing has changed a lot in Brazil. It's not the same right wing who uh, supported the military regime. It's a right wing that uh, uses the Congress, that uh, is uh, uh, getting uh, more and more uh, stronger in the democratic process, that is uh, consolidating democracy in our country. So it's much more complicated, much more complex. And uh, we have uh, new sectors like the agribusiness sector, which is radically different from the old oligarchies we have in Brazil linked to the land. They are now international groups like this uh, GBS that was created by the BNDES, which is now the largest meat export worldwide, and it's moving from Brazil to the US. So you see we, are becoming, we, we became very competitive in some sectors. So the same, your, you see general uh, take that we had this progressive political process. I'm not that sure. I'm going to talk about this tomorrow. You see, what is really progressive if there was no structural change? Look at Brazil now. Uh, poverty rates are even higher than they were when uh, the Workers' Party arrived in two years. And it's not Temer's fault. Uh, everything is not the, the parliamentary coup we had. We had to understand what was the direction we took in the past and where we get, where we did get now. So I think that we have to understand this. Otherwise, 
it's always where all because your point is that we should look at ourselves and i fully agree so we have to understand what happened also looking at ourselves because it was not that progressive okay no tax reform anywhere in progressive tax anywhere in latin america where they happen in any country there was a progressive tax reform anywhere so um the other point is social security reform they did not start it under Temer, sorry, he's just pushing further because it started, it was incremental, it started under Cardoso, it was pushed much further by Lula, Lula is the first to have uh, introduced the reform of the civil servants pension in Brazil, who, and Dilma implemented the fully funded regime, and it was against all uh, um, trade unions, etc., and she, she she pushed for it and she implemented something that has already been approved under Lula. So we have to understand how all the tax waivers, etc., that had been given uh, to those who moved from the public uh, sector to the, pen, the, to the fully funded pension schemes, and everything has been implemented under Lula. So we have to understand that was a dynamic that was radically different, because otherwise we think that Tamer, in two years, he would radically change everything, which is not true. Let's not forget that Dilma, she uh, offered around 1 trillion, 300 billion reais in tax waivers for 56 sectors with no conditionality. And this money was taken out from the social security system. This is why we have a deficit now, a true deficit. Because, you see, the idea is that we're going to make them more uh, uh, competitive. It's not true. Again, the liberalization of finance, it's not new. It's uh, increased and expanded under Lula enormously. And also the increase in domestic demands did not strengthen the industrial sector. I think that you have uh, data for the, uh, the growth of the industrial sector, aggregated data, um, including oil companies, the oil industry, and also the agribusiness. Because the industry went down, as you know, in Brazil, and most, uh, you see, the expansion of the um, uh, uh, consumption in, in, Latin, in Brazil was mainly through imports. Uh, Carlos, uh, what's his name? Carlos, Carlos Medeiros. He wrote a very good paper showing that imports increased just electronics 38.8 percent per year under Lula. So it's not after Lula; it's under Lula. Okay. So I think we have to look at things the way they happen, and then maybe we will be able to, if the time comes, to enjoy this favorable political moment first to change ourselves. Have some responses? <clears throat> okay, I'll, I'll try to be shorter than some of the questions in my answers. Uh, what's the best? Uh, what, what, what's the best tradition or economic theory on structural change? Uh, I would say it depends. You know, it depends of the question you're asking. Um, for instance, if you want to deal with the transition or the traverse to, towards green growth or degrowth or zero growth, uh, you know, I mean, it depends on what you feel uh, comfortable. So I, I cannot give you uh, an answer on development. I cannot give you an answer either. Uh, every time I go to, say, Mexico, Brazil, or Argentina, I am being asked what kind of policies would you suggest for these countries, I always answer, I bring you the theory, you are the experts, uh, you live in those countries, you're the ones who know whether the theory applies or not. Um, on the question on heterodox economics in the financial sector, uh, it's a good remark. Um, it is true that Goldman Sachs has been using this three balance approach of Godly for quite a long time now. Um, Minsky is of has always been popular among some people working in Wall Street. So when I was going to conferences at the Levy Economics Institute, there were always people coming there, you know, bankers, people handling billions of dollars or, or at least hundreds of millions of dollars of assets, saying I have this book by Minsky by my bedside 
and I, I read it uh, regularly before going to bed, you know, so it was always there. Uh, there are some people, uh, one person at BlackRock told me we don't hire neoclassical economists anymore because they are completely useless. We would rather hire a post-Keynesian economist or a historian or a, a mathematician or a physician or a philosopher. They are more useful than a neoclassical economist. Uh, on Engelbert's question about engaging with the mainstream, um, you know, I don't, I don't have a, a set position. I mean, if we don't, I mean, it's an individual question. If, if one doesn't feel comfortable doing it, then so be it. And, but I'm sure there are other, others among us who are quite willing to do it, and, and then they should, they should go ahead. They should do it. Um, in fact, I was asked to participate to a conference in Oxford. Uh, I was asked by farmer, and I, I said no. In, in fact, to help your be, your um, your proposition, you know, in order to say, well, uh, there's no heterodox in true heterodox in their group, <laughs> so I'm not. Uh, Anyway, so yeah, I'm sure it is possible to uh, go on with the mainstream, and uh, that's what I said. You know, you mentioned Borio. Well, uh, Bill White is in the same boat. They're both neo Austrians. Okay, uh, quick. Okay, sorry, quick. A structural change. I'm coming from Latin America, so the first item it's uh, ECLAC and uh, OIT. I love, sorry, uh, Wing Prealc that have most studied the structural change in Latin America and have proposed a lot since uh, Previch Singer theory and, and stuff. I, I will personally recommend political economy, Smith, Ricardo, Marx, that way, no Ricardo, uh, Marshall, and the other way. But I think the, the main two topics to be uh, taking into account, it's the passage from the uh, traditional division of labor to the new division of labor, delocalization, and looking especially in the production process and how that has changed employment, uh, qualifications, and stuff, because that rebuilds your economy from top to bottom. Looking at, for example, Korea and Taiwan and those economies. On development, again, Smith, Ricardo and Marx, and then we can discuss whatever else. Neoliberalism in Europe, yeah, it probably has changed, but it's the, same, it's the first time you really have neoliberalism. I'm sorry to have come from Latin America and say, yeah, you have tried against the right for a long time. You only had right, the right in Spain, in Greece. That is neoliberalism. And yeah, of course, it's tremendous, the, the conflict the poverty, the, the losses of houses, but that is neoliberalism. It has always failed. It can't achieve anything because it doesn't concern about what are the results. It's trying to balance the sheets, and that's that. The problem is, as Mark said, that they can't even balance the sheets. So that's two-way failure. But I think there are changes, of course, and regarding with the question of of Brazil. Of course, there have been changes in, in Latin America. The right, it's not coming by the hand with military coup. It's not killing uh, trade union members. It's a lot of things. I will get to that in a minute, but it does change. Of course, it changed. But when you ask what are the main uh, policies that they are applying, fiscal consolidation, no uh, monetary emission to finance deficit, uh, diminishing of uh, the welfare state, so the nucleus of their policies, it's the same. Especially in Latin America, that it's the case I know. I'm, I'm talking to the, my colleague from Brazil. I'm not saying, and let it be clear, that the progressive policies of Latin America are not a contradictory movement, of course. But especially for Argentina, if you look side by side, 90s and the 2000s, there are big changes. In Argentina, there were no labor market reform in order to set back the reforms of the 90s. We haven't structurally changed anything, but 
and it's a good question, is it a progressive uh, process if it doesn't change the structure of the economy? It's a good question. I don't know, but if you have to place a name to the 2000s decade, I think it was better for the working class in Argentina and Brazil than it's now. I believe that the difference between Argentina and Brazil is that the Labour, par uh, the Labour Party started the structural reforms, the neoliberal reforms, under their own policies. And they're all under their own government. They didn't wait for Temer. It's not Temer that it's doing all the hard work and nothing before. But you pointed out to JBS, the meatpacking company. We have national giants, more Brazil than Argentina, but that's, that doesn't change the economy. Most of the employment isn't in those, uh, in those sectors. It's not in progressive companies, so we have a problem. I'm not defending Lula and Dilma. I'm not. Don't worry. I'm not a Brazilian, so I don't have to. I'm not even defending Kirchner administrations. But I have to state, given what Macri, for instance, in Argentina, is doing just in one year and a half, let me get back to 2010. It's like, of course, there's a lot of problems, and they always have a lot of problems. But we are in, in the underdeveloped world for a reason. Nothing is easy. And that's the problem. But what should we do? That's the question. Then we see if Dilma and Lula were good or bad or right or, or left-wing parties. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's just Jay Christopher. All right, okay, because we have... Yes, there was... 30 seconds. Yeah. Um. Yeah, um, yeah, just um, the future of rethinking, we're obviously talking about that quite a bit, so this is just my personal observations, but we're growing very quickly, and a lot of us are getting older and don't want to quit, um, and so what I've seen is we're sort of adopting a spin-off structure where we have projects like economy that start within rethinking and then become legal entities unto themselves and then slowly drift to be actual entities unto themselves with almost different people working in both groups. And I think that that can be promising for a couple of different reasons, but particularly for being able to have like separate identities to be able to have a student movement that's saying like we are students, we're demanding this, and then to have another thing like a think tank that would say we're young professionals and we're doing this. The idea was floated at one point to do a uh, post-Keynesian hedge fund and actually try to like start making money and things. So we have more ideas than we have time, but I, I think the hope would be that there will be multiple different organizations and things that sort of come out of what is now both rethinking and the broader pluralist movement because uh, the lines are blurred in quite a different quite a bit of places there. And back to Epog.